Hello, friends, and welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. My name is Scott Cowan, and I'm the host of the show. Each episode, I have a conversation with an interesting guest who is living in or from Washington State. These are casual conversations with real and interesting people. I think you're going to like the show. So let's jump right in with today's guest. So I'm sitting down today with Craig Romano. Craig, I, I'm just going to ask this question. I'm on your blog right now, and I'm reading the headline of a post from January 14th of 2023. Headline says 2,321.1 miles. I did a little calculation, and that's over six miles a day on average over a year. That in itself is, well, for me, impossible to imagine. For me, like, no. <laughs> but uh, but f- what I want to know after you give the audience a little bit more of a backstory, but the question I really want to know during our conversation today is how do you, how are you so prolific of a, of a writer? So prolific of a walker, hiker, runner, biker, kayaking, you move your body a lot. I'm assuming you sleep and I know you have a family. So I really want to know how you, how a day looks in your life, but Really what we're going to start, I think, with is I was introduced to you by your publishing company, Mountaineer Press, and you've just, and I've got another question here too, Day Hiking Central Cascades, the second edition. Brand new book. Been looking at it. Beautiful. I always, we were joking before we hit record about uh, somebody else, and I was giving him a hard time one time about, because he just did a second edition of his book on hiking, and I'm like, do hikes change that much that we need to update them? So, Craig, welcome. Rambling Thanks, intro. Thanks for having me on the program. But how do you average six miles a day and be a writer? How let's let's just go there because I want to know that one. Yeah, you know. So first off, it's an average. So um, there are days off. <laughs> so, my, so when I'm when I'm on the trail, my my usual numbers are much higher. But a typical and I, I guess it'd be for me, it's it's more um, seasonal and, and cyclical. That that pretty much from uh, well, pretty much I I I, I hike or, or run, and in this time of year, it's run six days a week. So I have to get my, my dose of exercise. So that could just be a, a quick five six miles just to clear out my head uh, on local trails and roads. Um, but in the summer, it gets better. In the from about May to October is when I do most of my my research and. Those days are intense. I'll go out uh, blocks of time, three or four days at a time, and I'm doing 20 mile days, um, sometimes even more, uh, to, to really get all my um, to, all, all the research I need to do. So that's how it, how, it's how it all averages. In the wintertime, the weather changes. It gets darker and wetter, and I'm, I'm in front of the computer more. Um, but I still need to get out every day just to get my maintenance uh, exercise. And also, I, I should I'm a, um, I'm a hardcore runner, too. I've been a runner all my life. Um, I started a new goal this year. Um, uh, I want to run a marathon in every state. <laughs> so so um, I, started, I started that last year, and that's keeping me more focused to do longer runs during the wintertime, also, okay. instead of just, just during the summertime. So at the time of this recording, how many states have you run a marathon in? I just started, so I launched in um, my home state of New Hampshire, and my state where I live now, Washington, I started last year. Okay. Um, I ran uh, eight uh, marathons and ultras last year, but they weren't around the country. They are mostly here. So I did uh, Mesa in Arizona in February. I did the Los Angeles Marathon uh, last month, and I'm doing the Great Potato Marathon in Boise next month. So we're, so we're starting the process. <laughs> <laughs> I... Many years ago, a buddy of mine who will be the guy doing the editing of the show and I were sitting around and we came up with the idea of a, of a t-shirt company. We were going to call it potato wear because <laughs> potato is a shape. Um, and you're talking about the great potato run. And, 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 and I also see that you're sponsored by team potato. Is that, did I say that yes. correctly? Okay. Yeah, the so I'm, State potato Commission. Yeah. I'm laughing at all these references because I don't think a potato is being i i just don't i mean i just okay well you know it's the carbs 
uh, the potassium, it's, it's a great power food. <laughs> it is. I know it is. But but at the same time, I just look at us, look at the differences here between us. And, and you know, you see, I see this couch side and you see the carb side and the potassium. And I'm like, okay. Well, first off, that's an amazing goal that you want to run um, a, a marathon in all 50 states. And do you have a timeline that you're trying to accomplish this by? No, it, it would be really unrealistic to try to do that because I, you know, I do have a family. I do have a family. I do have a career. So, um, but I oh, like to, yeah, if I can, you know, get five, six, seven of them done a year, who knows? It's it, the hardest thing. It, it's not actually the running, you know, because I've got a level of it's. It's just um, the planning, trying to get to all these places, uh, and then coordinating. Like I was, I was, I just got back from Georgia. I was over there a couple of weeks ago. And I couldn't even find a, a marathon at time of year to go. So it, it's going to be problematic. I, I definitely would have would have run one if it was in the area. Okay. Uh, so so logistics make it tough, but it's just a goal to get out uh, to places that perhaps I've never been to. I've always wanted to go to Cincinnati. <laughs> they have a great marathon there, so why not? <laughs> okay. So, All right. So. I I never I know when I think of marathons, I think of the Boston and the New York marathons. Those are the right. the two that you know a non runner might hear of. And then I hear Wenatchee, where I live, uh, they, they had a marathon last weekend. This, yeah. you know, and, uh, uh, you know, so their Wenatchee had a marathon. Um, it seems like, I don't want to say, I don't know. Are they growing? Are there more marathons now than there were maybe a decade ago? Yeah, the thing, it's, it's amazing. And it goes in, it goes in cycles. You know, um, a big running boom in the 70s. Incidentally, I grew up north of Boston. And so we used to, I mean, the Boston Marathon is so much part of the culture. I actually did run Boston okay. um, uh, years ago. Uh, I qualified, and it's an amazing experience. But what's happened since then, the yeah, marathon is exploding. And uh, certainly people like Oprah got, got, a, got uh, that average, you know, middle-aged woman interested in marathoning. And Oprah's not average. I'm just going to put, put that <laughs> no, out. There's not. nothing <laughs> average about Oprah Winfrey. Nothing. <laughs> no, no, but she got people that never even considered marathoning to get out and, and run them. So, um, and it goes in waves. It, it's kind of come down a little bit. The, the big numbers t- tend to be the half marathon. Uh, that's where you really see a lot of, a lot of, and, and a lot of these events that have marathons, they have half marathons and almost always the half is bigger, but, but not, but not in every case, like in Los Angeles, the marathon was, was big. It was huge. It, it was over 22,000 people. And, oh. and the half was a lot, a lot smaller, but, but like in Wenatchee, I, I would probably, would be willing to bet that the half had a lot more people than in the marathon. I, I believe it did. I didn't. Um, I know a couple of people. I know one person that ran the marathon and one person that ran the half. Um, so my, my sample size is it's split evenly, but yeah. very small, very yeah. small sample size. And so, yeah, a lot of these um, these uh, communities around the country have these events now, um, where you know, in the, in the in the running boom, yeah, it was just you know the big events. Certainly, marathons. You wouldn't have a place, a place like Wenatchee wouldn't even it wouldn't be considered a place to go for a marathon. But but now it's not unusual, uh, okay. and, and marathons all over the place. Well, I think this is going to be my last question about the the mileage that you put in in 2022. How many pairs of shoes and hiking? How, what did you go through there? A lot. And it's funny. We always joke about it because my wife's an athlete too. And my son, I've got him. If you go into our garage where our shoe rack is, you'd swear that 20 people were in this, lived this house. <laughs> so, you know. but I can only find three sizes in the entire <laughs> yeah. thing here. I don't yeah. know what's going it's on. Just the hiking shoes, the running shoes, and then, and then the rotating too. I've got trail running shoes and street running shoes and then my, my racing <laughs> shoes. And, and you're always, yeah. So, um, I spend a lot of money uh, with books and Saucony, and, and if you're listening, I would love to be sponsored by you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, keeping the the you know the whole exploring Washington State theme going. I mean, Brooks's headquarters is here in in Washington. Exactly. You should you should reach out to them and and say, hey, I'm a Washington State guy. I'm I'm putting in a lot of miles, not just you know, and who knows, maybe. Yeah. And they are my. Um, Brooks, that is my trail running shoe, uh, Brooks Cascadia. I, I've been running in that religiously for 12, 12 years now. So pretty okay. Yeah. All right. Before we really, well, let's talk about this in context to your new book. Okay. So what you've, what I've heard from you so far is that you are on the trails a lot. You, you're putting in a lot of miles and you you call it research. <laughs> how, how do you, pre- what can, would you walk us through? your process for this last book 
What? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so basically, it was a, a second edition. So I had a, a blueprint already on the scope of, of the of the area. Uh, but with that, I wanted to make it like all my books when I redo them. I want to make them bigger and better. And mm -hmm. so, so looking at what I had originally, I have to decide. Okay, is there anything there that has to go for whatever reason? And you were, you were mentioned earlier. Do trails change? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the two biggest contributors in this area, uh, why, uh, why trails would, would change, would be funding and um, weather. So, so like in the National Park Service, uh, the National Forest Service, it's not funded the way it should be, and a lot of trails um, just aren't getting maintained. And so, there's a real danger that they're not going to hike them anymore. It's, especially if one of the um, the logging that's leading to it is washed out, and people aren't getting out there. So, so that I'm always looking at. And then the other weather, of course, we have fires here, we have floods, landslides, um, volcanoes. <laughs> so those things can change, <laughs> can, can, can certainly change the conditions of the trail. So. Okay, fair enough. I was just, I was kidding when I was kidding when I was talking to Brandon about this, you know, but it was like, all of all of your explanations make perfect sense. Just I, yeah, like, yeah, in certain getting, parts of the country, it might not be like I, I spent. I do a lot of hiking in in uh, New England too, where I'm from, and there's, there tends to be less change there. It seems the not much extreme weather. The trails are, are a little bit better funded in some of those areas. But then you know, if we go to places like Georgia, where I just got back, you have uh, different uh, issues like hurricanes and tornadoes, which can change can okay. change a trail also. Yeah. So after you've you know you kind of gone back and reviewed the first edition and you said, well, this, this hike is no longer accessible. So I, maybe I'll remove it from the book or whatever, how, whatever you're just, you know, however you described and you've described, once again, you've described when you're out on the trails as research, how are you, are you one of those guys with like, you know, total recall? You can recall everything you think about. Are you, are you out there taking notes? You know, walk me. Yeah. I am a couch potato. So walk me through your research and how you you gather it, and then and then we'll talk about how you. Yeah, absolutely. It. And and again, the question both. I, I I do have one of those memories where I can recall a lot of things that because because I write things down all the time. That's part okay. of the process. You know, my my degree is in history, um, which I because I can just rattle off numbers and and I just, okay. um, and just put it all into perspective. But um, but yeah, uh, when I. When I look at what, so basically I have to decide what I'm going to cover. And a lot of it is I've got my blueprint. So obviously I've got trails from the first round and even, mm -hmm. and, and many of them, I don't know if they're going to make it or not until I get back out there to see on the ground, which I should note that I hike everything I write about. Um, okay. Nothing secondhand. I'm out there on the trail gathering the information and then I'll, I'll go through maps. Um, I will go through websites of um, organizations. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll look at uh, a few trail re um, trusted trail report areas like the Washington Trail Association and see if there's anything new that I haven't heard about in, and then, you know, put that on my initial list. Uh, and then basically I come up with the game plan, how I'm going to hit all these trails. So I live in the Skagit Valley. So when I was working on, on um, the, uh, the Central Cascades, particularly in your area, that's not a place I'm going to go just for one day. And, um, it's a place I'm going to spend several days. So I'll, I'll car camp a lot. I have a good friend who lives in Plain, so I spend a lot. So yeah, so, so I have to you know, plan out my my, uh, my my itinerary, how I'm going to do it. So so I spend a lot of time in Plain, and, and it's great because my friend over there, Jody, she's an amazing trail runner and hiker too, so um, had a great partner and hit the trails with. Um, and then places like I have Stahikin in the book, so I had to plan ahead of time there and obviously go there. For, for quite a bit of time. So that's all part of the planning. Um, you know, it's, it's minimizing my travel time, it's minimizing my expenses, uh, and just, it, it, it makes sense to do it that way. And then the fun part, you know, and again, I, and I have to plan out through the year because there's snow levels, um, you know, uh, river crossings. So what can I do early as to, you know, as we progress later in the season? And there's some hikes too I want to do earlier in the in the year, perhaps because they're great for wildflowers, like over in Wenatchee, all the, the foothills area. Mm -hmm. Great time of year uh, in May to be over there. Yep. Uh, and then there's areas like the, the Alpine Larch hikes I want to do in October. 
Uh, and again, for photography, because I'm doing my own photography, so I'm trying to capture, especially in a book, I may only have one photo to, to really capture the essence of that hike. So I want to make that count. So I want to get it at, at its peak, whether it's flower season or large season or what have you. Okay. Um, so that's how I do it. And then when, once I'm out there, again, I'm hiking everything um, that I'm writing about. I'm often doing side trails if I'm going to talk about extensions. Um, I'm tracking everything uh, through, through GPS, you know, matching with my trusted maps and sources. I'm photographing and I'm taking physical notes. I'm not uh, just writing as we go along. Uh, it makes it easier for me to recall information, um, mm -hmm. but I, I'll certainly be taking pictures of uh, lots of signs and things like that too if I need that information. <laughs> well, let me so, interrupt you and ask this. So for, since you are your photographer, what are you using? Are you using an iPhone or are you, are you running around with a DLS, uh, DSLR and, and lenses or what, what sort of gear do you carry with you? Yeah, because I travel light, I guess I'm usually I'm, I'm trail running a lot and I'm trying to travel really light. I'm doing the majority of my photography right now uh, with a Galaxy uh, 22 phone. Okay. Um, so that's, but up until that point, I was using uh, a, a Canon point and shoot. I do have big fancy camera equipment that I've used on some of my projects, especially if I have to really go. But generally, if I'm trying to cover 20 plus miles in the backcountry, I can't carry five pounds of camera equipment with me. <laughs> so. It's not just the five pounds of it. It's the it's the dollar amount that you'd be carrying that you would you would right. we would find you in a huddled up in a ball and, uh, because you watched your ten thousand dollar lens fall. You know, it'd be well, worse. it's funny you say that because when I'm when I get caught in bad weather or I'm doing a river crossing or some, I don't care about me getting wet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's exactly, it's yeah. the phone. It's the, it's the, the, the $500 watch that I'm wearing. That's tracking me Right, it's like that, that right. I'm worried about getting wet. I'll, I'll dry out, you know, you'll dry out. Yeah. But that electronic gear may or may not. And yeah. Right. Okay. So you've done and my your... notebook too, my notes. I mean, that's paper. Okay. I have to have that. Have that so you're using paper. Screen. So you're using like a, a little notepad in your, Just your... little notepads. Yep. Okay. Yep. That I can flip through and it makes it really easy for me to, to recall the information too. I'm going to arbitrarily flip to a hike in this book. I'm going to just randomly stop right here and find the next hike that starts. Icicle Gorge Trail. Okay. Walk me through that one. Just I'm putting you on the spot in the sense from a from a research point of view, you went out to this trail. Yeah. I know nothing about this trail, so it could it's, be. It's a, a great. As a matter of fact, it's a great yeah. trail for um, people who don't hike. Okay. Um, I see. I see it's 4.2 miles. Doesn't sound too terrible to me. And so, there's not much elevation gain. That's the other thing. Because remember, you want more than just the miles. It could be 4.2 miles going straight up. This is 4.2 miles and pretty gentle terrain. Yeah. Okay. So when you went out there to do your research this for this this edition of the book, you you took your, your phone, you took your notebook get with you, you went out, you, you did all of this stuff. So you... Mm -hmm. You spend, I don't know, how, how long do you think you might have spent on this 4.2 mile trail doing research? That's funny you ask me that one because normally that would take me very little time. But I did the research with that with my son who was six at the time. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, so we actually spent quite a bit of time there because he wanted to soak in the river, <laughs> even though it was only about 40 degrees. Uh, yeah. Oh, he cracks me up. <laughs> even if he's out of my family, he's the only one of us who's native Washingtonian born here, but he always tell he jokes, his dad, I got your New Hampshire blood. But but even my New Hampshire blood doesn't allow me to sit in that cold. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so your he, research assistant took this into a new direction to yeah. see what okay. So we had to soak there for a while. It was a real hot day, so that that um, that helped. <laughs> okay. Uh, but but normally a four a four point two mile round trip hike, even just me leisurely taking pictures, things like that. It's it's going to be an hour and a half, two hours. Okay. So what I usually do with short hikes like that is I'm I'm doing something else uh, on that day too because again, I got to maximize uh, right. my right. time. Yeah. So all right, so we've done. We're just going to say you know you've done your your research and you've batched that up with other things, and now you've you come back down to your office where you're you're actually writing. Mm -hmm. Walk me through on that trail. How would you have assembled all your notes and all that into the, into yeah, the article? Yeah, so, so first of all, you, got, you, know, you know, I'm going to approach the trail generally. Sometimes um, 
uh, it, it may seem obvious, you know, there might only be one one way to approach it, but sometimes it could be several ways, different trails. So where, you know, where's the main place where people are going to start? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have, to, I have to write accurate driving directions to get people to these places too. And in that case, I'm going to um, start the directions from Leavenworth. You know, pretty much people know where Leavenworth is. Worth mm -hmm. and how to get there, and then where we go from there. Maybe too many people know. I don't. Yeah, but, um, I think that's that's. <laughs> yes, yeah, you're more accurate with that one right now. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we'll send them there. I'll tell them at the trailhead. First of all, you, you know what's at the trailhead. Um, you know, is there a privy there? That's important too. Um, mm -hmm. you know, just you know, people, uh, not only just for for uh, comfort, but for the environment. We don't want people going all over the place, which has become a problem in a lot of areas. Uh, so if it's not there, people can plan ahead of time, you know, stop at a ranger station or what have you. Mm -hmm. And then do you need a pass? That's another thing that's important. There's so many different uh, land management agencies out there with all their own rules and regulations. <clears throat> so I put it up front. And same thing, are dogs allowed? And if so, you know, what are the regulations? <clears throat> Is this hike good for children? And in this case, yes. And I'll put that in there. And then some other icons, too, that people uh, who are trying to filter their hikes. Uh, I like to, if it's a flower, a hike that has exceptional flowers. Uh, I love old growth forests. The hike with that. If it's historical, because it's another one of my uh, of my favorite in, of my interests. So I'll put a lot of these little icons in too. That the quick research, so people can see right up front. Hey, that hike sounds perfect for me. Or, or you know, let's check out a different one. And then we'll just go on a little description of the hike. But I try not to be overly descriptive because that can be boring and read like a uh, like a manual. So I'm trying to put some prose and make it flow. So the point that you could sit on a rainy day and read the book and mm -hmm. it can inspire you, entice you to go out instead of just being a boring point by point. So, um, and then with each hike, I try to take one facet and maybe elaborate a little bit more on it. Um, so it could be a particular uh, flower, an animal, a historical piece, something like that. Again, to give it a little bit more, um, to make it more than just a hike, to make it more of an experience. Okay. Uh, so, so I tried to do that. Uh, I mean, it doesn't always work that way, but but some of the hikes are absolutely fascinating. But there's more than just the pretty view. Um, and you know, and again, just what is the experience? On this hike, it's pretty much you're going through this you know, this cascading uh, creek. You walk along the side. It's all it's been carved out. There's some big uh, old growth ponderosa pines along the way. Really, really accessible to campsites to Leavenworth. Just about anybody can do this. You know, from very young to very old to people who don't hike at all. That's the kind of emphasis on this hike. So it's a great hike to, to, to get people interested. And I picked it completely randomly. And then that's great. <laughs> but glad I <laughs> Part of the reason I'm asking you these very, like, you know, tactical questions is the other thing ties into you, you, you move a lot, 2,300 miles in a year, but you've published over 25 books now. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you, you, you're prolific. And what I'm hearing from you is time management. You know, you're, you you mentioned that you couldn't find a, a marathon in Georgia at the time. I mean, you're 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 planning out. You've got a lot of moving parts because I'm going to guess that you're. Are you when you're writing? Are you working on more than one book at a time? Okay. Yeah. So you're yeah. batching things up and you're trying to be really effective time management. Yeah, uh, I know. It doesn't know. I, I'm not very good at it sometimes. Um, first of all, what? Yeah. I mean, come on, man. You've written 25 books. You've done 2,300 miles last year. I, I'm going to argue with you on that one. I'm, I'm going to argue. And the oh crazy gosh. thing, too, with the books, too, because um, like I have the new book now. So I'm on book tours. I do talks. Yeah. Um, I do tours and writing. I'm writing for uh, uh, the, um, the tread map. The new trail, you know, the trail map uh, app that's out. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing a lot. Of, it's it's over, and then again, I have a family. Right, <laughs> so. and, and that's and that's what I mean. That to me, from the outside looking in, is the is the um, part that's amazing because you have all of these other commitments, and and you're very prolific, and the quality is very high. And you're taking care of yourself physically. You, you, like you said, you have a family, and you're teaching your son to sit in forty degree water. I, I mean, he taught himself on that one. Okay, I mean, all right. So, <laughs> I, I kid, but so it's it's amazing to me that you are as organized. And you might go, "Well, I'm not organized," but I mean, I'm telling you that I haven't talked to a lot of people that have come anywhere close to the body of work that you've created in the amount of time. So, well, kudos you know, to you. 
a lot of it, um, blame my East Coast upbringing. I am definitely, uh, I'm type A. Okay. Uh, I'm goal oriented. Uh, always have been driven, very driven. Okay. Um, so I think a lot of it, um, that's kind of how I gravitated it. Because writing guidebooks, you have to be detail oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, again, you know, I'm self-employed. There's nobody breathing over my shoulder. You've got to be able to, to do this stuff get, and not go down the internet hole when you're doing research. Uh, so I think, yeah, there's definitely a different, uh, a, a certain type of personality that mm-hmm. um, that's going to be drawn to this, which is also very funny because a lot of my uh, friends and, and acquaintances in the trail running world say, when you see the stuff they do, I, I pale to some of the mileage and things they do. And then you find out they have families, they're lawyers, they're all these high pro, and same thing, they're all type A, they're all, and, mm-hmm. and I joke, so I can't speak for the rest of them, but I, I always say, like, if I wasn't doing all this, I'd probably I'd probably be an alcoholic <laughs> because it's like I got to do something to keep to get my buzz and keep going. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, well, so one of the things that I I read or I listened to a, a, a snippet of a podcast that you were on, you earlier when you were younger, you've you've biked all all states in the continental U.S. Correct? Yeah, I okay. uh, forty. I actually did Alaska too, and all the Canadian provinces. Uh, it was over oh. the course of, of three trips, uh, and it was all before I turned 21. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> um, obsessive? <laughs> oh. Absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that, too. Um, so from a very young age, I don't know where I got. I've, I've just had these existential crises that I realized life's too short. There's too much out there. Right. I need to see and do as much as I can because I'm going to get robbed of, of a long life because I can live five, six, seven lifetimes. So again, it's always cracks me up. You know, my house always sit there. It's like the word boredom doesn't exist. Nothing to do. And I just laugh at people, uh, not laugh, but I'm just, I kind of look at me like, how can you just be doing nothing when there's so much to do? Um, Cause you don't, you get one, you, you get one shot here, right. one shot. That's it. And I want to seize as much as I can. Eventually, you know, I'll, I'll have to slow down. I'll be forced to slow down. <laughs> but, no, um, but... but I want to keep going as much as I can. And that's the whole thing with the marathon, too. Um, so so two, two years ago, I, I, I pretty much had, yeah, I don't crisis number 25. I don't even know at this point. <laughs> so, I, I'm sorry I'm laughing. I should laugh at a no, person's crisis. Because you know. believe me, I, I, I'm really good at um I joke about it, but yeah, I've had so many. So what happens? Three major things converged on my life, and and, and one of them certainly converged on many people's lives. You know, we hit the pandemic. The pandemic right. hit, and that usurped uh, a lot of things <clears throat> and a lot of courses. At that same time, um, I developed an autoimmune disorder. Okay, it, it's that uh, that I thought was that I was done. Um, I have polymyalgia, rheumatica, PMR, and my range of motion. Um, I couldn't even turn my neck. Things it was, it was bad, and I thought I'm done at 59 years old. And then I turned 60 the following year, and I thought uh, of all the zero years, that's the one I hit the hardest because I thought, oh, God, there really isn't that much time left. Um, when I started looking at it, like all these, and that, and then through um, through medication, I've controlled my situation. I can still do. It's amazing. I can still do the things I'm doing. I'm so so grateful for that. And as far as the age, I keep thinking, you know, I may only have one really good hardcore decade left in me, hopefully a couple, <laughs> but I, I, I'm not going to take any chances. I'm going to do as much as I can because um, I don't know what tomorrow's going to be. And that's kind of in our household, how, how we, how we're, um, we look at things. You, you don't know what tomorrow's going to be. And, you know, and we want to be grateful for, for, for what we have and, and just really seize the opportunities and, 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 and live life to the fullest. Um, I'm, I'm nodding my head because uh, I recently, earlier, a couple of weeks ago, turned 61. Uh, dude, you and I, are, we're, 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 um, yeah. we're peers. Yeah, <laughs> and last year when I turned 60, my wife threw a surprise birthday party for me, which was really kind of cool. It was a lot of fun. Um, and that was fine. But I've really... I've really struggled for the last uh, month with the, you said the zero number year. Those don't get me. It's the, I'm 60 something or oh, thir- I, I yeah. so since we're about the same age, do you remember, well, you probably don't watch TV, but back in when we were in our thirties, so 30 years ago now, 
There was right. a show out there called Thirty Something. I remember the show. I never saw it, but it was it was very very popular. I do remember. Right, it. and I right. just remember watching that and going. Yeah, they're all dysfunctional. Well, we didn't probably use that word back then either. It was, you know, but anyway, they're all, they all have their issues, but they're all so much further along than I am. And it really, really messed with my head for, I, well, I let it mess with my head for a number of months, dare I say years. And I'm really trying to fight that here at 60 something. I don't, I don't want to be, because like you said, you, you used hardcore you you might have you said you might have another hardcore decade hopefully too i'm hoping that i have a not hardcore because i'm not that way but like i want to be productive in fully functioning for the next two, two plus decades mm -hmm. and that's not that long of a period of time when you it's look not. backwards exactly so, yep so i applaud i applaud your your outlook on things but we're going to we're going to go backwards because this this bike this north american bike expedition that you went on and i know you probably answered this question previously and i and i and i hope it's you know but from new hampshire what brought you to washington state why did you leave the you know the northeast and to why did you come to washington yeah, that's a good question, and um, I don't mind answering that because uh, I like to consider myself bicoastal. Okay, bicoastal. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm a native New Englander. I, I love New England. Uh, I never thought I was going to leave New Hampshire. Okay. And uh, I had been out here uh, to Washington uh, three times before before I moved out here, twice with my bicycle. Okay. Uh, and, and then I came out in the summer of 85, um, specifically to hike. Uh, so what happened, um, to kind of make the story shorter, um, I was married young, um, didn't work out and, um, I went through a really, really terrible time. And I joked, I said, I need to find my head straight. And, uh, I was living in Vermont at the time. I think, what is the state farthest away from Vermont? Washington. All right. That's where I'm going. Okay. <laughs> that's a joke. I tell you, but, but actually I, I had been out here before, um, I, I, I knew the terrain. I knew um, I wanted to explore it. My best friend, incidentally, the, the guy I biked across around America with when I was 18 years old, was a grad student at the University of Washington at the time. Okay. And so I just came out and uh, I hung out with him for a while and I decided, you know, I'm just going to get a job, wait, you know, waiting tables, cooking some, get my head straight and hike. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just, it's interesting how it all, how it all uh, ended up, I ended up, going, I ended up going back to college out here instead of back east. Uh, I went to the University of Washington. And I would, every year I just kept fighting, you know, God, I really love it out here, but I love it back home and just going back and forth. It just drives me crazy. Um, but as as life goes, you never know how things are going to work out. I My career started developing out here and, and things, and, and it looked like this is was all meant to be. Um, so I do spend a lot of time back in New England. I try to get back there quite a bit. My parents are still are still alive. Um, so I'm trying to spend, uh, make sure my son has lots of good grandparent time. I love the hiking back there. Mm -hmm. So again, the joking about being bi-coastal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the thing. There's, there's things about the, about the North, Northwest I love um, that you can't find in New England. There's things about New England I love you can't find out here. And it's just the way it is. <laughs> so, okay. No, yeah. it's, you know, it, it's, I, I grew up, in the Tacoma area, I went to college in Ellensburg. I moved to the Seattle area for a couple of decades. Moved to Tacoma, moved to Wenatchee in 2017. I've lived my entire life within the boundaries of the state. I have seen a lot of the United States. Um, I think I'm up to like 45, 42 states somewhere. I have a cheat sheet somewhere over here, but you know, it's you know, I haven't been to Alaska or Hawaii. I do. I can I can answer that one. You know, and I don't know that I, this is no disrespect to any other state. I I just don't know where else I would live. I just, there's so much variety opportunity. Um, it doesn't get boring here. I mean, I, during winters in Wenatchee, I would argue that it's boring because it, I feel kind of like I'm trapped, but we have all four seasons. We've got, you know, I've got ocean. I've got, you, you know, the drill, you, you, you know, I'm sounding like the tourism board for the state, just espousing the, benefits of Washington state, but we're really quite lucky. And so I stay here and we talk about it a lot now. 
But, you know, it's, it's funny you mention that because people get into that trap. And I've written about this many times. Obviously, I love it here. I live here. I, I chose, I could live anywhere. I, the type of work it, that I do. Right. I've been to four of the United States. And I go to, I go to states that people um, wouldn't even consider going. Like I was in Mississippi and Alabama last year, which I absolutely love. Um, and, and this is what I, I, I like to, I, and I've written about this many times, is that we get caught in this mentality, um, this contentment, like, Mount Rainier is spectacular. It is the most incredible place. Why go anywhere else? And then I'll tell you, I'm in the, the mobile, the mobile Tennessee Delta, which is considered America's Amazon. It's one of the most intact river systems, deltas, old growth bald cypress trees, alligators, incredible history, um, dolphins, you know, manatees. You're not going to find that in Washington. No. And no. that's the thing I'm always saying is that there's so much out there. I just got back from Georgia. I was in the Okefenokee Swamp. The Okefenokee Swamp is larger than Mount Rainier. Um, it's, a, oh. it's a wilderness. It, we counted, my son and my wife and I did a hike, a six mile hike, 48 alligators. We counted on our hike. Um, That's just, 49 too many. <laughs> yeah, I know most people, a friend of mine who works out here says it's equivalent to how uh, people move out here are afraid of bears. It's like we go down to Florida or, or Georgia. But the thing is, um, I've written a lot about where we get into this, you know, same thing when I, when I was growing up in New Hampshire, I thought New Hampshire is the most beautiful state in the nation. Why do I want to live anywhere else? Um, it is a beautiful state, but there's plenty of, plenty of places to live and, and the same, or at least experience. And I think lots of times our own bias, we get comfortable in an area. It's into the culture. Again, I grew up in New England. It's a very, very different culture than the mm -hmm. Northwest. Um, but I love Southern California. I love the South. It's it, it, it's just amazing. It's like God, people are so different, and it's great to embrace this this diversity of of, of culture. Uh, as you know, as I told you this on the phone, I always ask my guests about coffee, <laughs> and I'm going to ask you. This is I've never asked anybody this question this way before, so this is we'll see how this one goes. This is really important. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts. You, Starbucks. You nailed it. It's so funny. Uh, I'm drinking Dunkin' Donuts right now. Are you um, really? Yeah, I, I, I oh. buy it. But but I watch. I have Starbucks at the house too. <laughs> so and 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 you're gonna love this too. We travel because I'm one of those when in Rome do what the Romans do type right. of thing. So when I'm driving around Washington, Oregon, I need a coffee at Starbucks. Okay. Sure. When I'm when I'm back in New England, Dunkin' Donuts. When I'm in Canada, it's Tim Hortons all the way. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. I gotta I'm gonna put you on the spot. That's not an acceptable answer. One must go. For the rest of your life, you can only drink one. Which one's it gonna be? Oh man, you're yep. you're, you're nope. you know, one. One's gotta go. Oh, probably Starbucks is better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm not trying to coerce you into that answer, but okay. <laughs> all right. Oh, uh, but it's funny. I, I, um, I drive people crazy with a lot of things because um, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't like to get pigeonholed into right. anything. It's so funny because people, especially now, we, you know, we're so identified to our tribes and, and, and everything like this. And I, I just kind of like um, – I'm okay to experiment with different things. And, it, and, and someone having me drink something like – Someone offering me peats isn't going to be a, a, an assault on my Starbucks. Or your well, you know, if you if you know your coffee history, you'll know that the guy who started Pete's was the guy who trained Starbucks original roaster. So right. I mean, they're they're connected, you know, right? Ge and then, genetically, and Schultz, right? And then Howard Schultz is from the East Coast originally. Right. So well, and, and then Pete's is owned now by Green Mountain, which is you know, you know, so it's yeah. It's, you know, what's funny about Green Mountain because I was living in Vermont in the eighties. Green Mountain, that's which I drank all the time. I worked at a ski resort. I'd stop at the little coffee shop. That was the coffee. Right. And now, you know, then they got bought out by what, Keurig or some big corporation. Yeah, Keurig, yeah, Keurig yeah. guns, yeah. Yeah. But um, no, Green Mountain was my coffee um, when I was in Vermont. Um, and of course, Ben and Jerry's is, <laughs> is my ice cream no matter where I am. We, we are in agreement on that one, okay? There, there's no, there's no, 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 that. Yeah, no, Ben and Jerry's in their single serving pints. I mean, those are yeah. single serving containers, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, Tillamook, Tillamook's acceptable, but Ben it's, and Jerry's is where it's at. But yeah. ben, ben and Jerry's is different. It's that, yeah. Okay. Now, in, but this is a, a, I'm kidding about the whole coffee thing, but I do have a, a, a genuine coffee question. 
how do you prefer your coffee? How do you drink coffee? Are you? Hot. <laughs> it's got to be hot. <laughs> okay. And so you... My wife drinks it cold. Like it's like you can't. Oh, how can you do that? I, you know? <laughs> I well, I can. I can too. But oh, so, are you just are you a, a, just a coffee drinker? Or do you like lattes? Are you are you buying you know what I jokingly call the fufu drinks? Yeah, no fufu fun... drinks. Yeah. No fufu. No black yeah, coffee. Just, uh, coffee with a tiny bit of cream. That's okay. it. Yeah. But and if it's you... good coffee, I can drink it black. Um, so when you're yeah. drinking coffee. Lighter roast or darker roast? Uh, I prefer the lighter, but dark's fine. Um, okay. I, I, I I get um, acid reflux quite a bit, so I got to keep keep some of that toned down. Okay, uh, all right. You yeah, know, because... do I drink in the backcountry? Yeah, what? Do you, oh, that's an interesting. Yeah, what do you? Just some some coffee connoisseurs. I mean, they carry all the gadgets and everything. Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I am keep it simple, like mm -hmm. Starbucks via the best thing since since sliced bread. It's great. There's yeah. a, have you tried any of these coffees that are coming in like tea bags? Uh, I think I've tried some in the past and they taste more like tea. <laughs> so. There's a, there's a, a roaster out of Spokane, a uh, roast house. And they, their signature coffee is what's called the F-bomb. And <laughs> it. it's, yeah, it's, it's because the owner, she's been noted for saying the f-bomb a lot and so they is she, they, is she from new york <laughs> i don't know where she's from originally that's a really good question but their f-bomb in these little and i'm, I'm calling it a tea bag, which is the wrong thing but in a, in a little steeper there's you know steep yeah because yeah. i'm with you they're yeah they're more like tea and this one's i think it's better than a via packet okay let's, i'll let's, try let, yeah. let's put it that way now yeah. um and the nice thing is the entire packaging is compostable. That's so, even better. Yeah. So that's that's an advantage for when you're going out in, in the wilderness. What brought you to Washington? And don't say oh. your feet or your bike. But yeah, uh, no, it was uh, yeah, it was the whole. I was going through a crisis. Mm. Um, you know, that's right. The, that's right. Yeah, yeah. and, and far, I came yeah. out to get my head straight. Right. Yeah. No. It's and it's funny because at the time I was 28 years old, and okay. so it's like depressed the world it's everything's awful you know it's like everything i went through but again this kind of gets into philosophy and zen and all that it, it was it was meant to happen i had to go through the darkness to get to the light and i think a lot of times people don't realize that when they go through and that looking back it was all part of my my, my course mm -hmm. uh i would not be here with my career you know with my with my wife and my child all these things that that because of this awful thing that happens to me that forced me to um, to make a change, make a big change, and to take a risk. And I think I should. That's the other thing I like to emphasize too. I think too many people, because I write about this a lot too, um, get into their comfort zone. They're afraid to to take chances, to take risks. They're afraid to fail, especially you know the younger mm -hmm. generations. Like you're taught not to not to fail. You know, again, you failed out. You have to fail. Oh, um, absolutely. That's that's how you learn. Even as an author, uh, how many you know? It's it's cliche, but how many rejections that I went through before I before I finally was accepted to write? I mean, that's that's part of the business. But if I quit after I was rejected a bunch of times, that would be the end of my career. Mm -hmm. So I do the same thing physically um, too about pushing your body, see what you um, what, what you're capable of doing because you really live and really experience life in the pure emotion when you get out of your comfort zone and just go for it now i'm not telling people to be reckless it's got to be mm -hmm. calculated because you know you don't want to be reckless and so so one of the things you know i enjoy doing is is endurance events just seeing what my body is capable of doing and then again i love getting out of my comfort zone traveling and just getting into unexperienced places and and, and seeing i don't go to disneyland i don't go to Mazatlan. i've been to paraguay i mean things like that okay. right. that's the type of <clears throat> type of stuff i want to do um yeah, and as I tell you, it, it just uh, it intensifies your life. It's amazing. And, and, and the other thing I should emphasize, too, because I get asked this a lot, too. People always ask me, you know, where are my, some of my favorite places because I've, I've traveled so much. And I have lots of them, but some of my, my, my uh, best memories are the experiences of the people that I met, of situations that came that, that intensified it far more than some spectacular mountain or ruin somewhere. So again, don't be afraid to meet people. Don't be afraid to, to get out there. Wow. Uh, I've met lots of people. I'm, I'm, I'm really approachable. Um, you know, yeah. I'm, oh. uh, 
I, I love meeting people. I meet people wherever I go. Um, and uh, okay. yeah, that can be part of it, a great experience. I'm not going to ask you your favorite hike or anything like that, because that's just, <laughs> well, that's you. just, that's just, just impossible. But is there, with regards to Washington State, in Washington State only, is there a, a hike, a place, an event that you haven't done that is on your list of things you want to experience? Um, you know, there's very few hikes in the state that I haven't, that I haven't gotten to. Um, uh, some of the ones I have are, are more than, uh, there's a few backpacking hardcore okay. stuff that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel that, that scene, that's, that's a good point too. I mean, I love the state. Um, I've hiked it thoroughly. I mean, I've written from, you know, yeah. all four corners yeah, you um, have. <laughs> and I never get tired, but that's kind of where I'm at right now is that, um, again, there's so much time left. There's so much more out there that I want yeah. to see now mm -hmm. too, um, which is which is just one of those things too. It's like okay, I've gotten to the point, there, and there's still surprises too. But usually when I when I hike Washington, I I know the plants I'm going to see, uh, you know, it, I, which is good. So again, you stick me into a totally different environment. I was in Southern Arizona in February. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what the heck I'm hiking through. Um, so that sense of um, excitement. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, a discovery starts all over again. The same thing coming back from Southern Georgia, same looking at plants. And, and I mean, it's a whole different world. Um, so that's kind of where I'm starting to shift some of my focus now uh, is trying to get back to some of these places I haven't been to since my biking days mm -hmm. or places that I've always wanted to go to. Uh, but as far as Washington, there is one thing. It's funny you mentioned because of all the hiking I've done, there is something that I have not done. And I didn't think I was interested until recently, again, because life is getting shorter and I've got a son that I'm trying to do things with. I've never climbed Mount Rainier. Oh, and okay. I've done the Wonderland Trail. I've, you know, I've hiked every trail in the park and all the, the peaks. And all that. Uh, I've been up Mount Adams. I've been up Mount St. Helens. Um, okay. I've never been up Rainier. And so <clears throat> I think that's something I'm probably going to end up making happen at some point. And, and I'd like to do it with my son. So oh. that's... Um, so, so yeah, there, there, so even in the state of all these places that, that I've, I've hiked to there, there are still some, some experiences in, in, that, that I have not done yet. And, um, and that's yeah. a, that's a big iconic, um, and I don't, I don't think of you as a climber per se. So I didn't, exactly. I'm I don't, not, I didn't not, expect yeah. that you would yeah. have climbed. I mean, I wouldn't have been surprised if you had said, yeah, I've climbed right near. I was talking to a, a guy, a friend of mine who's been on the show a couple of times. And I know him as a musician, right? And so I think of him as a as a musician primarily. He's a history nut. He nice. and, he and a buddy for the last couple summers have recreated old historic climbs nice. from from Fort Nisqually to Rainier, uh, nice. following in the the journals of, from the 1850s of these guys. Oh. And I was talking to him, and we were recording an episode, and I just casually asked. I said, "So, how many times have you summited Rainier?" He goes. I think 13. Wow. And I'm just like, huh? Cause I, you know, huh. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, he, he's into it. So well, it's funny because there's certain things, you know, that's it. you know, as we get older, you get this danger of, of being set in your ways. And I've, I've always tried to, you know, and it's tough. I know certainly mentally, I, I, yeah, it's tough. Um, but I try, you know, things that I thought I poo pooed at one point. And then you start thinking, you know, so again, I'm not a climber. I'll, I'll, I'll do some scrambling, but, but um, generally I, I'm more into endurance. I like to move. Mm -hmm. um, but, it's, you know, more and more I think of who I am, what I do, living here, the impact, the experience. I'm thinking, man, I got to get up right here at least once because right. this is one of those, one of those. And again, I know it's going to be, it's out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it would be an amazing experience uh, okay. to do that and to, to, to see the state literally yeah, no. from a different perspective. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I got a couple of questions I like to ask authors. Now, help me out here. When was your first book published? What year? Oh, boy. Uh, 20 years ago, maybe. Yeah, okay. that sounds about right. So we're going to go back 20 years. Yeah. Different landscape. That's going to be kind of cool. So hope, Now, you said you had a good memory, so I'm, I'm expecting an answer here. Okay. 
what did you feel when you saw your first book in public for the first time? Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I don't want to um, trivialize motherhood, but it feels like it's your child. It's like I gave birth to this printed. Um, and, and I always joke too, I mean, the, the pain of putting these things together. Right. It's, you ask any writer, it's, no, it's not fun. I don't know why we do this. Uh, I'm, I'm editing a book right now with, I hate it. I hate the process. I can't stand it. The fun part is going out there and doing the hikes. But, um, and then doing the talks afterwards, sure. and, you know, reaping the rewards that way, meeting people. And, and talk. But the process is, is grueling. It's, yeah, it's not fun. So, yeah, after you get that out, it's just it's amazing, you know, the amount of work you put into it. You see your name on that. It's your ownership. It's you. It's right. part of who you are. Um, yeah, it's an amazing amount of pride. And then all of a sudden, especially, you know, I, I, I had um, written articles since I was a teenager, you know, supposed to be published and you know that. But, but now I can um, carry that word author. You know that right. it just elevates you on a different a different level. So yeah, there's certainly and, and I I think I would be a liar if I told you that I'm not ego driven. Um, I think most people in the creatives uh, most creatives are and yeah. and, and they're, you know, they're they're lying if they're they're telling you not and if they aren't ego driven they're not going anywhere they're in the coffee shop you know <laughs> you know pretending to be a writer. Um, so. Um, yeah, I think that that drives me, and, and you want to get that feedback, and that feedback drives me. Uh, okay. and, and you, you want, you know, every time I joke, it's like, all right, I'm done writing books. I don't want to write anymore. And then people will write to you and say how much they love your work, and they've got you out, and, and you meet them like, God darn it, I got to write another one. It's like, suck me I, back I, in. Okay. I know. I keep thinking, what's my second act going to be? I'm like, I've been, I've been an author for two. I, I need to do something different. Now. <laughs> so where did you see your book for the first time oh that's a good cry i can't can't pinpoint that um other you know you see the catalogs of that but just even walking into bookstores i mean right. uh and making an effort to actually walk to that area of the bookstore so do you are you one of those authors because i've talked to some and this is i'm and ha, if i ever write a book i will do this too so i'm making fun but yeah yeah i was talking to this author and she goes, and I faced the shelves with my books. I walked into the bookstore and I, I put mine up here. And she, I can't remember what author she said, but I'll take a conversation, you know, with Stephen King. I put his on the bottom and I moved mine I up it. and faced them up. And, and I was laughing because it's like, I would do the same thing. Yeah. So when you, and I talked to another author and I asked him this question, like, where did you see your book for the first time in public? And his answer, and I share this every time I talk to an author because I, his answer just shocked me. His offer, his, and he writes about Seattle history, mm -hmm. kind of prohibition era oh. history. So Seattle's CD underside, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so where did you see your book when the when it was first published? He goes at Bartell Drugs. <laughs> I'm like, huh? He goes, yeah, Bartell's has ha, it has a great local book selection, yeah. and yeah. I was like, that'd been really odd to me. This, you know, yeah, the walking funny. to Bartell's and my book. You'll never so. know. Matter of fact, my, my Urban Trails, Vancouver, Washington book, mm -hmm. the number one place that it's being sold, and I actually do a sign in there, it's at one of those fancy schmancy grocery stores. <laughs> so okay. I, yeah, not not at a bookstore, not at the national, you know, at the Van okay. Port Vancouver, but at a grocery store, you know, at a high end, you know, really good grocery store. Um, okay. I visit the only carry a handful of books. Mine's one of them, and they sell hundreds of it. And um Wow. Yeah, you never know. Uh, Picking up some sliced turkey and a loaf of bread and a book. And, and my book. And so it's funny, cool. I was doing a book signing at a grocery store. So <laughs> Interesting. Now, now, currently for the new book you, I, on your website, you're, and depending on what people listen to this, this this isn't evergreen. So right. if you're listening to this in six months, folks. And so uh, after October of 2023, this is probably not relevant. <laughs> uh, where uh, you're on a book, kind of a book tour right now, but local yeah. stuff, right? So right putting you on the spot with this one. Do you enjoy that aspect of the career? For the most part, yeah, I do. Um, a lot of authors don't, especially if you're an introvert. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't like getting out there and, and selling yourself and talking to people, it, it, it can be misery. Um, it's really important as, as an author. Uh, if you're going to survive, you have to get out there. There are, I don't even know how many millions of books that are published every year. It's, it's overwhelming. The majority of books don't make money. Mm -hmm. um, 
And to be a successful author, um, people have so many choices. And the days of the big publishing companies put pumping a lot of money into a book, those are gone. Now, publishing companies expect that an author is going to be a publicist. They're mm-hmm. going to be um, active on social media. They're going to be you know, pursuing talk. I do all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. It's part of the reason why my books are successful. I mean, part two, I mean, they have to be good books. They have to be good books. Um, but I know even when I push uh, my, my publisher, um, when, I, when I come up with a title that I want to write, my publishers even told me that they're skeptic. Matter of fact, Vancouver, this book, like Urban Shows Vancouver, they're very, very skeptical about it. Uh, but because it was coming from me, they knew, well, one, you know, I, I really believe in this. I, I, everything I'm telling them that there's a Vancouver scene, believe me, there's a demand for this book. I spent a lot of time down there. Did, and that I will be promoting it. Um, they're like, okay, we're going to take a chance because uh, it's you. I think if someone else had pitched it, it would be, it'd be skeptical. So, uh, so that's part of it too because um, – yeah, I'm just not going to write the book and let it sell itself because it, it doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do uh, contest promotions constantly. I'm involved with organizations. And, you know, uh, I mean, I believe in these organizations too. Like in Vancouver, Washington, I belong to the Friends of the Columbia Gorge. I belong to the Columbia Land Trust. I, you know, I support the Mount St. Helens Institute. I believe in all those organizations too because mm-hmm. it, 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 you're practicing what I preach. But also these are, these are great uh, to have these connections just for being viable. I mean, I think a lot of authors don't realize you have to get back to, so you can't just talk about, uh, you know, the environmental issues and, 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 and not be a part of the, uh, a part of it. I, I do a lot of work with the Washington trails association. Um, uh, I mean, people actually think that I, I work for them. I, I, you know, I, I do write for them. I am on you know, the payroll there, but, but I'm not an employee, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. not, but, but I'm constantly preaching about them. They're a great organization. I, I participate in their hackathon every year and I'm one of their biggest fundraisers. It's a lot of work. I don't get physical money. I don't get money back from that. It takes a lot of my time away from writing projects, but I believe in it. And again, it, 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 uh, a lot of my readers will see that too, that, Hey, this guy really believes in the trails. He's just not writing books because he wants to see his name in print or make money. I mean, it's, it's lifestyle. I'm committed to it. And I think, uh, readers are savvy. They, they, they're looking for integrity. They, mm-hmm. they, they, you know, they're going to support an author. Um, uh, you have to make a connection. You can't just be faceless or, or do something they find, um, you know, against what they believe in. So I think that's really important. And, and to do that, you have to be, you have to be out there. So, I so. couldn't agree with you more. Out of curiosity for you, what is, what's working well? For book promotion for you what where are you where are you finding how do i want to say this you have an audience you you've over the over your career you've established an audience and the care and feeding of the existing audiences is, is important Absolutely. but so is yeah. so because you're gonna have churn there just people are gonna okay. pass away yeah so you have to always be in, in, in looking to expand your audience so what's working for you with this type of book? What's, where are you meeting new, new readers? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny, uh, boy, 2009, I think go back when this whole new thing called social media was, you know, yeah. and I remember my, my office says, you got to get on that. And I'm thinking, oh God, that's so frivolous. I don't want to, I, I don't want anything to do it. Um, and, you know, <laughs> for better, or for worse, um, I've really used Facebook in particular to, to help market myself. As a matter of fact, um, I have these new authors that will actually follow me to see what I'm doing mm-hmm. because I have, I have been successful with Facebook. So it's been really good. And again, part of what I did, and you're experimenting, it's not a direct marketing campaign. Mm-hmm. People are not going to follow you if you're trying to sell to them every mm-hmm. time. So what I've done is I've created a community. Uh, and, uh, and my community is very, very diverse because I welcome that. Uh, I know that and I get, I meet my readers uh, out on the trail at talks and everything. They expand the whole spectrum, you know, politically, demographically. Yep. It's wonderful. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build a community where our common love, the outdoors, trails, healthy living, that type of stuff. Work on that. And so that connection. Um, so I have a free flow 
of uh, communication. Uh, I always respond back to people. But better. I mean, I don't feel I'm above that or it's, it's, or it's taking away from my time. Um, it's important. And uh, so between that and then actually going out there and doing the talks and meeting people, um, yeah, again, it's just being part of the community and not just some reclusive writer who's just sitting there. And, and uh, just really being um, mindful of everything I do and, and, and uh, connected. You know, you can't, um, again, I'm part of this, this larger community. Right. Uh, and that's hard to accept. I know, well, wow, when you're just, when you're younger and you're doing things and you realize, God, I'm on the spotlight now all the time, uh, for better, for worse. For better, it's obviously, it, it's helped make me a better person. <laughs> Um, for worse, it's like sometimes I just want to get angry. <laughs> it's like, you know, at the trailhead, someone's bothering me, and I have to, I could be one of my readers. I can't go off on that person. Right. <laughs> so. Right. That's always like the, you know, somebody who's got, and I'm just going to pick, you know, X, I'm just going to call it XYZ brand. I'm an independent XYZ distributor, and they have that on their back of their car as they, cut you off and slam right. on the brakes right you do that all the time you yeah. got to be careful of the you know the your yeah the public yeah so tiktok yes or no no definitely not <laughs> uh, you know and it's funny with that because um i always joke at tiktok too i'm way over the age on that um and then I, i'm sorry i will say it's chinese connected and i don't want anything to do with the company no, I, that's I, I, my data from china i, um, I think that's a I, this is about as political as I'm going to ever get here. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a, a legitimate, and I think it's becoming, I think more and more of us are becoming aware of that possibility and yeah. should be cautious. How's that? Yeah. Okay. No, it, 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 yeah. I mean, I may be overly cautious on it, but that's how I feel <laughs> about it. But on the other side, you'll love this too, because this recently I'm building up, I sent a lot of my millennial friends into, into heart attacks. I, I opened up an Instagram account <laughs> and they're like, is that you <laughs> Romano? <laughs> so, so, you know, again, I realized I, I got to get with it. Um, I have a very good, my audience on Facebook tends to be older. That's the demographic. Yep. Um, I need to reach younger people. And, and on the same, what's been great for me when I first started um, as an author, the whole publishing industry was in transition. Right. You know, the internet was exploding. Yep. Magazines that I wrote for were going out of business. It was a huge change. And I really questioned, I'm thinking, I'm done uh, as a writer. I, I don't see a future. The mm -hmm. internet's going to put us out. And I would do these book talks where, and I'm in my 40s at the time, um, where I'm the youngest person there. Every, mm -hmm. My audience is all older than me. And I'm thinking, God, once, once my readers die, I'm done. But then a, a few years ago, I started noticing an unbelievable change. Like there are 20 somethings in my audience. Now there's young people mm -hmm. who are coming to see me talk and everything. I'm not a dinosaur. Um, the books are not, you know, are, are, are viable. And I'm starting to see a lot of the younger generation isn't, you know, they're embracing books again, mm -hmm. seeing uh, again, um, that everything on the internet is not necessarily word. Uh, and like I always tell people too, you get what you pay for. Right, uh, a lot right. of, a, a lot of what's out there is crowd crowdsourced. They're data mining. They're sponsored by somebody. When you buy one of my books, you already gave. You already put the money down. There's no pop ups. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> data mining. Um, you know, you trust the source. I got to do it, and that's what why I you know why you want to pay twenty dollars for my books instead of getting something free off the internet. A lot of young readers are savvy. They get that, and. Um, yeah, so I'm seeing growth in, in that Good. demographic, which has been very, very encouraging. Uh, I think, too, when I, once I had a son, um, I, you know, I became a dad late in life. It's funny, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a boomer who, who has, who has a, a very young kid. So, so I made, it, it made it easier for, you know, um, it's almost like it opened up a whole new demographic. Now, all of a sudden, I have young moms, you know, following right. me because, right. you know, I'm taking my son hiking. And they, so, again, trying to stay viable because I don't want to be pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. uh, into one demographic. I'm trying to be, you know, God, no, I think that's, yeah. that's a savvy business thing. So the, the whole thread throughout this, this whole conversation for me with you has been just this, you're prolific. Lots, lots of, lots of, you know, lots of like, lots of miles, lots of pages, lots of words, lots of promotion. You, you are 
busy. The last thing we're probably going to talk about today, because we could keep going, but let's, the last thing we're going to talk about today is there's another website that you run called Hike of the Week. So you're committed to 52 additional pieces of content a year on Hike of the Week. How did you get started with this thing? Yeah, that's, that's funny. That, that was originally, uh, I'd go way back. I was doing some work uh, with, um, with a guy who runs a weather uh, website, and he was kind of offering the service. We wanted to do a hike of the week, and then we were trying to pitch it to um, some other weather agents. We actually had, of all places, the Weather Network, which is a Canadian um, channel. We we had we had a contract with them way way back. I was doing that was a lot of fun. You think I, I was flying into Ontario and doing all these hikes? Okay, okay. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> it never panned out, and I kind of just kept the site and went, "What do I want to do with this?" You know, I I I, I own the domain. It's a great hike of the week. And basically, it's in essence, it's it it it, it helps promote my books. Sure. Um, so what I do is I, I I almost all cases, but not always. The hikes are hikes in a stripped down version of what you can find in one of my books. Okay. And I try to entice people. I, I, the hikes are all seasonal, so it's stuff you can do when I when I publish it. It's like this is a hike you can go out and do now. Mm-hmm. I try to do less popular hikes so people you know are intrigued. And then I'm hoping that a lot of people who are following that go on, are going to click the link or go to the bookstore mm-hmm. to get the full deal. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's that's pretty much uh, what that's all about. No, it's brilliant. I mean, it, it, you know, we could go down, you know, uh, the marketing tangent of, of your of your business, but that's that's brilliant. I think it's great. I think what I like about it is you're providing timely content. You're not just saying here's 52 hikes. You're saying here's a hike that's appropriate for April 13th. Because that's the last, that's the article that I'm kind of scanning over here on my iPad. Bridal Veils Falls after, oh, yeah, visit yeah, after heavy yeah. rains. So that's April 13th. Yeah. Coming up next, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be something that's spring related. Right. It's, you, we'll and we'll then, start shifting to Wenatchee soon. Actually, right. And then you'll, there. you'll rotate through and it's, it's seasonal. And I think that's a brilliant marketing strategy because this, this book, you know, you're round, but I've got to go through and figure out, well, maybe not year round actually, because it's, Central Cascades, but yeah, I have in, in each hike. I'll actually have the, the dates when, when right. the trails are open. And I think yeah. I think yeah. what you're doing is is the whole strategy is is quite amazing. So we're going to wrap up, but I want to ask you. And what I'm going to do, I'm not going to ask you to share all the places that you're on social. You've already said Facebook. We're going yeah, like to put some links. Instagram, yeah, yeah. yeah we're going to put some yeah. links to your social channels in in your website in in the hike of the week on on the show notes for people to look at. So that'll be easy for them. So you've done a lot of these conversations with people over the years. You've been on Evening Evening Magazine. You, you know, you know, you've been, you've endured me for an hour. What didn't I ask you that I should have? Oh boy, <laughs> I don't know. Um, the the host cheat card. <laughs> I know. Um, boy, is there any? Uh, <laughs> I, keep, I think I've covered a lot of the, the bigger things. Again, I always, you know, my book is open, and it's got. I've really enjoyed this too, as far as. You know, I think I told you earlier, I do a lot of interviews and, and, and some of them um, I'll just lose interest in because they're asking me a lot of the, you know, what's your favorite <laughs> type of stuff that, that, and, and it, it's just, but not really getting into a lot. And um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's just so much more to uh, what I do and what I experience and what I want my readers to, right. to experience <clears throat> than, you know, and again, people, People hike for all kinds of reasons. I, I, I go People hike for all kinds of reasons. I think there's a lot going on now. Um, if you go to a lot of these sites, people, uh, it's interesting watching. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when um, Harvey Manning, my predecessor, I was spring. I mean, they were the you know, uh, legends in this right. area. I was well aware of them. I had all their books. Uh, they influenced me. Um, and it was a different world then in that, you know, uh, most of what they considered the enemy um, were resource extraction industries, things like that, that weren't compatible with um, with a lot of the recreation. Mm-hmm. And what's happened as the states change, as everything changes, the resource extraction is, has, has really faded in the state as, as, a, as a large industry. Mm-hmm. And the threats to our trails have become different. Uh, government not funding, for one thing. But what's even more interesting that that uh, perhaps would have been hard to predict in, 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 in 
is that a lot of recreationists are fighting among themselves now. Um, mm. And so you see a lot of this. Um, certainly Harvey, if he was alive today, he would be no fan of me. Uh, and I imagine I would be uh, attacked by him. Um, he was a very, very um, polarizing guy. I mean, he would fit in well with this, this, this society, I guess. But um, I try to be the opposite. I, 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 I try to write. So, you know, I trail run. Harvey mm-hmm. would hate that. You know, Harvey had one method of, of hiking. Uh, you just do it this way. So, no, no. People, it's deeply personal to everybody, to, to that person who just saunters, gets down on the ground and photographs mushrooms, to the person who wants to have the fastest known time on a trail. It's personal. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't judge or, 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 or attack. It's there. If everyone, as long as they're abiding by proper ethics to being outdoors, you know, leave no trace, being respectful of other users, we should get along, <laughs> you know? But, we um, it, yeah, you should. But it's really interesting. I'm on a lot of these forums where I'm more just watching, not participating and for a lot of reasons. I don't want to get involved, but I need to see the pulse out there. And it's really interesting seeing, you know, people just getting all worked up, like all oh, those, you know, trail runners or those mountain bikers, assuming that mountain bikers are on trails that are open to mountain bike. I mean, once you, you know, that's the thing that's going for everyone. Too. And everyone thinking that their mode, not everyone, but a lot of people thinking that their mode is superior than so you know, back in my day we only carry 50 pounds and i mean you hear that kind of stuff and it's like and again you wonder it's part of why we are afraid to embrace uh change or, or why is something different and so you're seeing now um and this is a great thing um that's a double-edged sword this uh prolific uh amount of new hi- new hikers mm-hmm. uh and people coming from non-traditional hiking backgrounds right uh you know from underserved communities and and um this is great and getting people out and yet you still see people the gatekeepers uh that you know only think and it always cracks me up and, and there's something else I, I can't remember i always have fun with this i'll write something um you know about olympic national park and i'll just use that as examples okay. and i'll have people from port angeles well all those people should not be in our backyard Answer you mean uh, all those people shouldn't be in our public lands? Um, you know, Olympic National Park belongs to the people of California, New Jersey, Arkansas, Puerto Rico. <laughs> I mean, it is ours. It's just because you live there, it's not your mm-hmm. private backyard. And so I, I, I see a lot of that, that kind of attitude. Uh, and I, I get it. People are very, very, um, I felt that way when I was in New Hampshire, the White Mountain National Forest. It was all, you know. Right. That forest belongs to everybody, not just the people of New Hampshire. And you realize, you know, it, it's we should be welcoming. Uh, these these are this, these are public lands for all of us because you want people to connect to those lands, you want them to support those lands, and you want them to vote to expand those lands and everything. And and if you're coming across as a gatekeeper and leaders, and if people don't feel welcome there, why why are they going to to care about protecting the environment? Not to mention, too, it's just ethically wrong, I mean, you know, to, to, to treat different people that you're not welcome here. So, so I've seen great changes there, um, and, and it's amazing, no matter where I go. Uh, diverse people, whether, again, whether I'm hiking in Georgia, California, Washington, New Hampshire, seeing lots of new faces uh, out there, uh, uh, and we need to be as, as welcoming. And, again, and if people are, are not versed in um, proper ethics, that's where people like me with Washington Trails Association, where a lot of the influence, that's where we can take the lead in setting examples, and this is how, but not by chastising and, and uh, turning people off, but by educating. So uh, a lot of the organizations like WTA, the Mountaineers, uh, a lot of these groups, um, they get it. And mm-hmm. if you look at their, it's funny because 30 years ago when I came out here and I joined the Mountaineers right away, and I thought, they were kind of a, an old guard organization. It's kind of like, you know, the old white guy from Boeing. It was like their private. I mean, and I hope I'm not, you know, but that's, that was my feel, especially coming from the Green Mountain Club in Vermont, which is all a bunch of hippies. And, you know, right, it, right. it just felt like a very, very different. Uh, and it, it didn't feel welcoming to a lot of people. Um, it's not that way anymore. It's a very, very different organization. And again, this is my interpretation, so I hope I'm not offending uh, anybody for 30 years ago uh, I, I i still belong to the mountaineers it's a it's a very different organization it's very very welcoming 
uh, and lots of young people, lots of uh, you know, people from diverse ethnic backgrounds and, and, and socioeconomic backgrounds, which is really mm -hmm. important. Uh, and same thing with WTA. Um, and they're being more reflective of our society. And so we're not, and, and it's interesting because hiking has that um, history. I mean, the Appalachian Mountain Club, when it opened in the 1870s in Boston, was an elitist rich guys organization. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, now it's the largest sort of hiking, hiking organization in the country with you know, every type of background represented. So again, it's just that, that evolution. Change okay. is tough. But uh, I see a lot of these hiking groups that I've done talks, their, their membership's dying. It's dying because they're not welcoming new blood. Right. Um, you, you, you know, you, you've got to do that. So, okay. And, and, and uh, don't be afraid what some of these new people are going to bring to the, into the to your organization. Absolutely. All right. My last question for you, and I'll let you go. It's a very, very serious question. Cake or pie and why? Definitely pie. Cake, cake is not very healthy. <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> these pie, there's, there's fruit disguised in it. <laughs> I will admit, I'm not a sweets. I'm not a sweets person. Um, a lot of it when I when I was um, diagnosed with PMR, um, I pretty much eradicated uh, a lot of sugar out of my okay. diet because sugar causes inflammation. Mm -hmm. Though I do have one weakness. Okay. Like that. Chocolate. Okay, so chocolate. Uh, I don't eat any of that sugary stuff out there, but uh, chocolate. Yeah, okay. it's it, it's on every hike. I love chocolate, and you'll appreciate this spot. So one of my my eleventh um, essential, especially when I'm doing long uh, long hikes and runs, uh, contains two of the food groups. It's uh, chocolate covered espresso beans. So there you go. Perfect. I can get into hiking. I can get <laughs> so, into hiking. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's my. Chocolate covered espresso beans. That's my, my, my magic pill. Awesome. <laughs> so. Craig, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Uh, I compliment you on your career because anybody that's published 25 books, A, either is crazy yes. or B, <laughs> loves what they do or both. Yes. And <laughs> and I you know, I applaud the the, the volume of publications that you participate in. I also applaud the, the amount of research that you do. It's, it's impressive. And you have been extremely gracious with your time. I've enjoyed this a lot. Thanks. Likewise, I, I've really enjoyed being on, on, your, on your program. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, like I said, best of success with this book and the next one. The, well, last question. I promise yeah. this is the last question. So at the time of recording, it's April of 2023. Right. How many more books do you have planned to release this year? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked me that because this is my shameless plug time. There we go. <laughs> so, Please. Go. So what's coming out the end of uh, this year, so around uh, January, is the second edition of Day Hiking, the Columbia River Gorge. So, okay. you know, it, again, that Vancouver area that, that I know. Right. My wife grew up in Vancouver. I know the area really well. <clears throat> okay. Now we're going to shift. The, the brand new book that I have coming out after that is the other Vancouver. Uh, oh. I've been waiting so long to do this book. Uh, COVID shut me out of the country for a few years. <laughs> you know, okay. so, uh, I live an hour south of, of the, of the uh, British Columbia border. I absolutely love it up there. So I'm doing an Urban Trails Vancouver, BC book, which I am thrilled. Maybe I'll be up there next weekend. I'm doing a talk in Chilliwack, and I'll be doing research up there. Okay. And then after that is a statewide rail trail book. And, and it will be my first hiking guide that won't necessarily won't really just be hiking specific uh i'll be talking about cycling in, in there okay. too so it's going to be a, a comprehensive statewide rail trail book and that's going to be um a lot of fun researching because um there's a couple of 250 mile trails i have to do all all the miles which i will be doing uh a lot of that research by bicycle so, that's so. good for you and so shameless plug time where do you want people to go to find you just where do you want, where do you want to send, where's that one spot you want to send them to? Yeah, you go to craigromano.com. Um, you want to connect me, Facebook. I'm, I, you can go there, Craig Romano Guidebook Author. Uh, it's my page. And then um, you definitely support your local bookstores. I encourage that. But, um, you know, Amazon carries all my titles and you'll get them soon. Barnes & Noble, REI. Um, yeah, and then please, uh, I know I'm going to be doing a lot of talks. Even if you get this late, I will be lining up stuff again in the fall. 
Uh, I usually, I usually, I'm in Tacoma, Vancouver, Seattle, East Side, Bellingham. Um, we'll get out to Wenatchee too. So there we go. I'd lo- I'd love to go to listen to you speak. That'd be a lot of fun. Well, again, thank you, and uh, we will get this published soon. Thanks, Jeff. Hope you enjoyed the show. You can reach me on Twitter at Explore Law State. I'd love to hear your comments. You can also visit our website at explorewashingtonstate.com. If you know anyone who would like the show, it'd be amazing if you'd share the show with them. This is the biggest way that we grow this show. Good old word of mouth. Glad you were here with me today, and I hope to have you listening to the next episode. See you then.